Once upon a time, in West Africa, a tale unfolded, a tale of triumph, wealth, and the rise and fall of empires. It all began with Sundiata Keita, a visionary leader whose victory over the Kingdom of Soso in 1235 laid the foundation for the Grand Mali Empire. Sundiata, with his keen understanding of governance and a formidable army at his command, embarked on a journey of military expansion that would echo through the corridors of history. His rule marked the birth of a new era as the Mali Empire flourished, becoming the largest empire ever witnessed in Africa. As time flowed like the Niger River through the Sudan region, the reign of Mansa Musai brought the Mali Empire to unparalleled heights. Under his watchful gaze, the empire expanded its territory, celebrated cultural brilliance, and amassed staggering wealth through its mastery of regional trade routes. Mali, nestled between North Africa's arid Sahara and the fertile banks of the Niger River to the south, thrived as a middle trader. Gold, salt, copper, ivory, and even the tragic trade in slaves crisscrossed the vast expanse of West Africa. Muslim merchants, drawn by the allure of commerce, found a home in Mali. The rulers in turn embraced Islam, spreading its teachings through centers of learning like the renowned city of Timbuktu. Yet, amid the bustling cities of Niani, Jenei, and Gao, the heartbeat of Mali remained in its rural landscapes. The farmers, steadfast in their animist beliefs, cultivated the land, weaving traditions into the fabric of their lives. However, the echoes of Mali's greatness began to fade in the 1460s. Civil wars tore through the empire, new trade routes beckoned elsewhere, and the neighboring Songhai Empire rose to prominence. Despite the collapse, Mali retained a grip on a small part of the Western Empire into the 17th century, a testament to the enduring spirit of a once mighty realm. Before Mali's grandeur, the Ghana Empire had paved the way in the 6th to 13th century, creating a realm fueled by military prowess and the riches flowing through regional trade. Although not connected to the modern-day Ghana, this empire faced its decline by the end of the 12th century. Civil wars, rebellions, and meager harvests cast a shadow over its glory. In a dramatic turn of events, the Kingdom of Soso, led by the imposing Sumangaru, tightened its grip on the Mali region. Trade restrictions imposed by Sumangaru sparked rebellion among the native Malinke tribe, signaling a shift in the tides of power. As the sun set on the Ghana Empire, a new chapter unfolded, the rise of Mali. The story of West Africa, etched in the annals of time, whispered of empires that rose and fell, leaving behind a legacy woven with threads of conquest, culture, and the inexorable passage of time. Also, the Lion Prince, Sundiata Keita, emerged as a beacon of hope for the Malinke people. Sundiata, meaning Lion Prince, embarked on a journey to liberate his people from the oppressive rule of the Kingdom of Soso. The 1230s witnessed the birth of a charismatic leader who would change the course of history. Sundiata, rallying disgruntled chiefs weary of Sumangaru's harsh reign, forged a powerful alliance. The stage was set for a decisive battle at Krina in 1235, a battle that echoed through the ages as Sundiata emerged victorious. The spoils of war included the capture of the old Ghana capital in 1240, a pivotal moment that would shape the destiny of the lands Sundiata sought to unite. Under the vast canopy of African skies, Sundiata envisioned a realm where tribal leaders, influential Arab merchants, and the Lion Prince himself would form a centralized government. The assembly, known as Gabara, declared Sundiata the supreme monarch, showering him with honorary titles like Mari Diata, meaning Lord Lion. The empire Sundiata envisioned, the largest in Africa up to that point, bore the name Mali, a testament to the place where the king lived, thrived, and dreamed of unity. The Gabara further decreed that future kings would be selected from the esteemed Keita clan. However, the title wasn't automatically granted to the eldest son, setting the stage for intense rivalries among potential heirs. The king, or Mansa, governed with the assistance of an assembly of elders and local chiefs. Audiences were held in the regal palace or beneath the sheltering branches of a massive tree. As the supreme source of justice, the Mansa, guided by legal advisors, presided over the intricate tapestry of governance. The king's ministers, including the chief of the army, master of the granaries, and other officials, play crucial roles in the intricate dance of empire management. Yet, the Mansa retained a monopoly on key trade goods, a symbol of authority that extended even to the possession of gold nuggets. The mystical aura surrounding the Mansa manifested in the loyalty of all slaves, exclusively pledged to him. The king's presence demanded reverence, 
no one could witness him eating, and visitors bowed barefoot, pouring dust over their heads. The cult of leadership and the extreme centralization of power around a single figure became the linchpin upon which the fate of the empire rested. As Sundiata navigated the complexities of governance, the Mali Empire flourished. Sundiata expanded his territory, incorporating the old kingdoms of Ghana, Walata, Tadmeka, and Songhai. Niani, strategically located near the Sankarani River, was chosen as the capital. Protected by mountains and close to vital trade sources, it became the beating heart of a burgeoning empire. Conquered chiefdoms contributed tribute, allowing local chiefs to continue ruling with a Mali-appointed governor as support. The empire prospered, boasting a triple income from trade taxes, profitable buying and selling of goods, and abundant natural resources. Sundiata's vision bore fruit, creating one of Africa's richest empires that left Europe and Arabia astounded. And, as the sun-drenched lands of Mali stretched beneath the vast African sky, the empire flourished, echoing with the bustling sounds of trade and the echoes of a bygone era. Nestled between the lush rainforests of southern West Africa and the formidable Muslim caliphates of the north, Mali's strategic location became the heartbeat of prosperity. The Niger River, like a lifeline, provided a gateway to the heart of Africa and the Atlantic coast. Across the Sahara, camel caravans, under the watchful eyes of Berber nomads, brought treasures from the north. The Mali rulers reveled in a triple income. They levied taxes on trade, engaged in the profitable buying and selling of goods, and tapped into the rich veins of their natural resources. Gold, the heartbeat of Mali's wealth, flowed from the rich regions of Galam, Bambuk, and Beret. One jewel in the crown of Mali's trade dominance was the legendary city of Timbuktu. Rising from the sands and founded by the nomadic Tuaregs around 1100, Timbuktu stood as a semi-independent trade port. Positioned at the bend of the Niger River and the starting point for trans-Saharan caravans, it was destined to become one of Africa's most vital trade centers. Mali's rulers, casting their eyes upon Timbuktu's potential, soon monopolized the city. It transformed into a bustling cosmopolitan hub, where ivory, textiles, horses, glassware, weapons, sugar, cola nuts, cereals, spices, stone beads, crafts, and even human lives, traded as slaves, exchanged hands. The city became the heartbeat of commerce, where goods were bartered or exchanged for commodities like copper or gold ingots, salt, ivory, or even cowrie shells from distant Persia. In the first half of the 13th century, the Mali Empire experienced a renaissance under the rule of Mansa Musa. With an army of around 100,000, including a formidable cavalry corps, and the skilled general Saran Mandian by his side, Mansa Musa extended Mali's reach. The empire doubled in size, stretching from the Gambia and Lower Senegal in the west to the Western Sahara and Gao on the Niger River in the north, and reaching the Beret region and the Gold Coast in the south. To govern this diverse realm, Mansa Musa implemented a strategic division into provinces, each ruled by a governor personally appointed. These governors oversaw local taxes, justice, and the resolution of tribal disputes. The administrative machinery, ever improving, ensured meticulous records sent to the central government at Niani. With conquered chiefs contributing tribute, more trade routes under Mali's sway, and an abundance of natural resources, wealth cascaded into the hands of Mansa Musa and the elite. The king's riches became legendary. When he visited Cairo in 1324, his generosity and opulence were so overwhelming that the price of gold plummeted by 20%. Rumors of a kingdom paved with gold spread far and wide. In Spain in 1375, inspired mapmakers etched the first detailed map of West Africa, featuring Mansa Musa adorned with a resplendent gold crown, triumphantly clutching a massive lump of gold. Under the sun-soaked skies of the Mali Empire, the story of Islam unfolded, weaving its way through the bustling markets and towering mosques. As Arab merchants traversed West Africa, they carried not only goods but also the teachings of Islam. The chronicles of travelers like Ibn Battuta and Ibn Khaldun whispered tales of Mali's conversion, with even the mighty Sundiata, the first ruler, said to embrace Islam, as recorded by Muslim chroniclers. Yet, the echoes of Malinke oral traditions, preserved by the skilled griots, painted a different narrative. In this rich tapestry of stories, Islam had been present long before Sundiata's reign, but the first ruler did not cast aside the indigenous animist beliefs. 
Sundiata's son, Mansa Uli, embarked on a pilgrimage to Mecca in the 1260s or 1270s, and this pilgrimage trend continued among Mali's rulers. The true blossoming of Islam in West Africa unfolded during the reign of Mansa Musa. Inspired by his travels to Mecca, Mansa Musa brought back Muslim architects, scholars, and books. Mosques, like the grand structure in Timbuktu, known as the Great Mosque, emerged as architectural marvels. Quranic schools and universities gained international acclaim, delving into studies beyond religion, encompassing history, geography, astronomy, and medicine. Libraries flourished, housing tens of thousands of books and manuscripts, many of which endure to this day. The waves of conversion attracted Muslim clerics from distant lands, transforming Islam from a foreign faith to a deeply rooted aspect of West African identity. Native converts, educated in places like Fez, Morocco, emerged as scholars, missionaries, and even saints. Despite this, ancient animist beliefs persisted, particularly in rural communities. Travelers like Ibn Battuta, who explored Mali in 1352, noted this duality. The language of Islamic studies was Arabic, creating a gap between the educated clerical class in towns and cities and the broader population. The Mali rulers, mindful of the majority's attachment to indigenous practices, embraced a unique variation of Islam, bridging the gap between the old and the new. Amidst this cultural and religious transformation, the Mali Empire stood adorned with distinctive architecture. The scarcity of stone led to buildings crafted from beaten earth, reinforced with protruding wooden beams. Mosques, with towering minarets and massive doors, became iconic symbols. Warehouses, known as fondaks, housed goods and merchants alike. Excavations at Niani revealed stone foundations, confirming that the wealthy built stone houses. Arab chroniclers described another type of dwelling, constructed with beaten earth bricks and conical roofs made of wooden beams and reeds. In the heart of this cultural tapestry were the griots, narrators of legends and community histories. Music accompanied these oral traditions, with songs reserved for revered individuals, especially warriors and hunters. Religious festivals featured masked dancers, creating a vibrant tapestry of artistic expression. The Mali Empire's artistic legacy extended to pottery and sculpture. Sculptures, crafted from pottery, wood, brass, and occasionally stone, depicted human figures, warriors on horseback, and ordinary people. Incised, painted, or adorned with three-dimensional pieces, these artworks adorned homes and served ritual or burial purposes. As the Mali Empire flourished, it became a canvas where Islam, architecture, and art converged, creating a rich tapestry that continues to whisper through the corridors of time. The golden era of the Mali Empire, with its grand mosques, scholarly pursuits, and cultural vibrancy, began to wane as the 15th century cast its shadow. The intricate threads of royal succession, loosely defined and often contentious, became a tapestry woven with civil wars. Within the palace walls, brothers and uncles clashed in a struggle for the coveted throne, sowing seeds of discord that would hasten the empire's unraveling. Amidst the internal strife, external forces emerged as harbingers of change. New trade routes beckoned, diverting the flow of commerce to other paths. Rival kingdoms, most notably the burgeoning Songhai to the west, seized the opportunity to ascend, casting shadows over the once mighty Mali. European ships, bearing the insignia of the Portuguese, navigated the West African coast with increasing regularity. The Saharan caravans, once the lifeline of trade, faced formidable competition from these maritime intruders, altering the course of commerce from West Africa to the Mediterranean. In the year 1433, ominous echoes reverberated through Mali as the Tuareg launched attacks, leaving scars on the empire's territories. To the south, the Mossi people, masters of the lands beyond the Niger River, joined the chorus of challengers. The stage was set for Mali's decline, with external pressures converging to test the resilience of its once unassailable foundations. As the curtain of the 15th century drew to a close, a formidable figure emerged on the horizon. King Sunni Ali, sovereign of the rising Songhai Empire, cast a shadow over Mali's diminished realm. In the year 1468, his forces swept across the remnants of the Mali Empire, reducing it to a mere pocket in the western expanse of its former glory. The grand tapestry of Mali's legacy faced its final chapters, with the Songhai absorbing what remained of the once sprawling empire. The intricate patterns woven by generations of Mali rulers now found a new canvas in the annals of history. In the mid-17th century, 
the narrative of Mali converged with that of the Moroccan Empire as the last vestiges of Mali's glory dissolved into the sands of time.